Hello and welcome to our guide to legendaries in Shadowlands. And by the time this video is done, you're going to understand how this very vital part of the Shadowlands expansion actually works. So you'll know how to get them, how long it's going to take you to get them, how they work on launch, what to expect in terms of Soul Ash, plus a whole bunch more. You'll just get it. Now, if you would like your own legendaries, then hey, you can check out the two pins, Demon Hunter and the 2020 edition logo pin that we've got over on our Patreon this month, plus there's also a bunch of art. Then also be sure to subscribe for a whole bunch more Shadowlands guide content in the coming days. And with that said, let's go. What are legendaries? Well, legendaries in Shadowlands are mostly like Legion legendaries, just that they do not have all of the BS RNG drops, and there's a lot more involvement from the economy. They are more of a progression system that you actively engage with. Each one of the legendaries has a major effect, and these are actually inspired by many past legendaries, Azerite traits, and tier sets. Some of them are quite complex and involved and really do change how you play, but others are very simple. Most of them do have a focus on PvE or PvP utility, however, there are a few that are focused on other bits of Shadowlands content, such as Torghast and the Maw. Your legendary acquisition process will begin early on in Torghast, where you will encounter the Rune Carver, and after a few quests, he will offer to craft legendaries for you. Now, don't worry, the game will guide you through all of this stuff, you basically can't miss it. Of course, though, what you're going to need is materials for your legendaries, and this is where it's big, because those are Soul Ash, a crafted base item, stat missives, and then memories. The memories are the actual legendary powers themselves. So let's go through these various different materials. First, Soul Ash. Soul Ash is the big important one. This comes from some introductory Torghast quests, and then from each of the two active wings of Torghast per week. Now, there is also then a little bit that can come in from your Covenant's mission table, but it's not humongously important. Now, we'll cover Torghast, the overall thing, and how to really get the most out of it in another video, but the basics are important for legendaries. So, each week, two wings of Torghast are available. There are eight difficulties. These are called layers, right? So, you've got the eight different layers of the two different wings. Now, the higher the difficulty, so the higher the layer, the more Soul Ash you will be rewarded with. Now, that's because whenever you complete a layer, let's just say layer three, you'll actually get all of the rewards in terms of Soul Ash from layer three, layer two, and layer one. Now, of course, to unlock layer three, you would need to complete layers one and two. Now, this does mean that a lot of your progress is going to be front-loaded here. You will spend a fair amount of time going up and up and up the layers of Torghast. And then the point, though, is more that once you've actually done that initial legwork, eventually, you know, you'll have layer 8 unlocked. And then you'll be able to get all of your Soul Ash rewards from just doing each wing at layer 8 once a week. And that really will be pretty damn time efficient. Now, these difficulties are progressively unlocked as you beat each one, but there are some restrictions on launch that you should be aware of. On launch, layers 1, 2, and 3 are active. Layer 3 is really quite easy, though, so you will be able to do all three of them. Layers 4 through 6 then become available on the 8th of December. That's, of course, when Shadowlands Season 1 starts. And then, layers 7 and 8 will become active a week later alongside the release of the Castle Nathria Raid's Mythic difficulty. Now, what you probably want to know is the actual numbers, right? How much of this Soul Ash resource do I need? How does it all work? Let's go through the numbers. A rank 1 legendary, which is item level 190, will cost you 1250 Soul Ash. Now, based on the current beta setup, you will eventually earn 1240 Soul Ash per week. That's 470 max per Torghast wing, and then another 100 from the weekly follower mission. But of course, the thing is, we don't really know how often or just when that follower mission is actually going to start spawning, though. But at any rate, the first two weeks, of course, cap out at layer three, as we covered. So in those weeks, you'll only be able to get 305 Soul Ash from each wing for a total of 710 Soul Ash. That means that it will take you two weeks to get enough Soul Ash for an item level 190 legendary. 
Now, there is another 900 soul ash that comes from Torghast related quests, but those quests do appear to be time gated over the first few weeks of the expansion. Now, once layers 4 through 6 unlock on the 8th, and then layer 7 and 8 unlock on the 15th, that will raise up the combined amount of soul ash you get from Torghast Weekly to 970 and then to 1140. And that basically means, right, you can get either two legendaries in the first month of Shadowlands, or you can get one and then you can upgrade it to rank two. Of course, though, by the time we all have unlocked layer eight of Torghast, well, you're essentially going to be getting a rank one legendary per week in terms of the quantity of soul ash that you get from the system. Now, that's the thing. We really do need to cover these ranks. You can craft legendaries at rank ranks 1, 2, 3, and 4. These cost 1,250, 2,000, 3,200, and 5,150 soul ash, respectively. Uh, don't worry, though. You can craft a rank 1 legendary, and then you can upgrade that to rank 2, and so on, with the upgrade cost being equal to the cost of the new rank minus the cost of your current rank. So, essentially, it is efficient in terms of the amount of soul ash that you're spending. And that means your choice is very simple. Do you put all your soul ash into one legendary or and you can try to rank it up or do you try to spread it across having multiple legendaries so that you have more gameplay choice? Well, we'll talk about that a bit later, but for now, we've got to move on to base items. Next, the bind unequipped crafted item. So crafters actually create the base items that the rune carver needs to actually make your legendaries. Now to unlock these recipes, crafters have got to reach the maximum skill of 100 in Shadowlands for their craft skill, and then they need to complete the intro Torghast quests up until the bit where they free the rune carver. Now, armor crafting professions can make base legendary items for their respective armor types. So a leather worker will make the leather ones or the male ones and so forth, with jewel crafters then also being able to make rings and necklaces. Now, these items require a lot of materials, and of those materials, some of them actually need to be enchanted or even have alchemy be involved at some stage. The point here is expect these to be really expensive. I mean, hell, there's even a hard gold cost in the form of Arboreal Shards. They're a Vanderite and they cost 125 gold. But the thing is that recipes need between 8 and 15 of them, so that adds another 1 to 2,000 gold on top of the cost of the player-created materials. It's a lot of stuff. Shadowlands then also makes use of enchanters to enchant materials too, so really, creating one base legendary item, that is a team effort between the gatherers, the crafters, the enchanters, everyone's getting involved. So depending on how the auction house looks in a few weeks, it may actually be worth holding off just a little bit until those legendary prices come down, or maybe if you're playing in a guild, working out, well, how is your crafting team actually going to come together and get you this stuff? Now, this is all doubly so when it comes to the upgrade system, because currently, in order to make a rank 2 base item, crafters need to make 15 rank 1 base items. That's going to be extremely expensive for them to do, right? And then also, you need to remember that to upgrade your legendary, you need to bring the rune carver, your existing legendary, the one you want to be upgraded, then the required soul ash to make the upgrade, and then a higher ranked base item. Now, this actually does mean that if you can directly craft a rank 2 legendary, you'll actually save some gold, because you won't need to have purchased the rank 1 base item. Yeah, it can get a bit confusing here, but it does make sense once you get a hang of it. Now, note here that the upgrades, right, from rank 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, they are just, just the item level and the secondary stats. They have no effect on the power of the actual legendary effect itself. So you do get the most bang for your buck by just, you know, getting one of them quickly. Scribes are not left out, though, because they actually are involved. Legendaries can be given two stats of your choice. Yeah, you can select your secondary stats. This is done via missives, which are crafted by scribes. And yes, you can use your missives to select the stats of your legendary, though you can't double up on the same stats. So, of course, expect to put some more gold into purchasing missives for your legendaries as well. 
Okay, legendary powers. Yes, the last thing that we actually have to consider here is the actual legendary power itself that you will put on the blank sort of legendary bit that we covered in the previous segment. Each class has got four class-wide legendaries, and then each spec has four unique legendaries for it. There are then also eight general legendaries at work across all of the classes. Now, these legendary powers... I would say work like a more simple version of Essences from Patch 8.2, where they drop from certain sources, and once you own them, that's it. It's very much unlike the Legion Legendaries, because with these, they're targetable, right? If you are a Fury Warrior, and you want the legendary power that comes from Mort Regar, which is one of the wings of Torghast, then once that wing of Torghast is open, you know that if you want to get that legendary power, that's where you've got to go. If you maybe want their AoE damage legendary, well, then you're going to look at where the powers are, and then you're going to know that you need to wait until Castle Nathri opens, and then you need to go and kill the Stone Legion General's boss. Now, this overall has got two major implications. One, there is less RNG involved here because you can target what power you want to unlock. Now, some legendaries do not have a 100% drop rate, but, right, others, like those from, say, World Bosses, which of course only happen, you know, once a week, those are a 100% drop rate. The other implication then is that you may not get the legendary that you want right away. There are some legendary powers that come at random from the Great Vault. There are others that come from the PvP Honor Vendor, and there are even some that come from the last boss of the new raid. The worst possible case, perhaps, is needing a legendary that comes from a world boss that's the last in the rotation of the four world bosses. That would mean that to get that power, you would literally have to wait a month from launch. So that's what's up there. Now, while getting your vital class legendaries is an important thing, you may also want to pick up the stable Phantasma Lure and the Third Eye of the Jailer legendaries at some point, because those give you more power in Torghast, um, well, basically Torghast and the Moth, they're pretty important there, and uh, certainly, the better you are in the Moth, the more Stygia you get, and Stygia is pretty useful. Now, moving past that, there is another nice touch here. The legendary powers are actually shared across your account, so if you had two warriors, then yeah, all your warriors warrior ones, they'd be shared. But more realistically, this means that the general legendary powers can be shared across your character. So unlock them in your main, and then you're, you know, getting an alt up, you can quickly give that all one of them. Now then, Blizzard have also added a random grab bag that gives you a random legendary that you do not have, and uh, that will become available in your Covenant after about six weeks of Shadowlands, and that's just stuff that you actually purchase using some of your Covenant resources. So, yeah, watch out for that. Um, but of course, the really the usage there is it's a little bit of catch up, but also if you're the type of person you've slowly unlocked these for ages and you just say never want to touch PvP, you could get one of the PvP acquired ones using this particular system. Then the last thing to consider here is that each legendary power is tied to two or three slots. As an example, you can only put in Safu's proclamation on the neck, shoulders, and chest. So Generally, you've got to think there. Now, I would say most of the time you'll want to pick the highest value slot when you're crafting a legendary, right? Uh, because, you know, your legendary probably will be your highest item level bit of gear most of the time. So making use of the extra stat budget that, say, a chest has over some bracers, that is a wise move. Okay, what should you do, right? What power should you get? I think this is actually quite obvious. If you're focused on a particular type of gameplay, obviously, target the legendary that's best for that first, be that raiding, mythic plus, or PvP. Now, to actually know what's good there, I would say, you know, videos are not going to be super useful because of, you know, they can be out of date. So what I would say is go to your usual class resource to find some advice. Wowhead is pretty good, right? And they are really good at keeping their stuff up to date. If you want more of the bleeding edge stuff and some of the theory crafting, you could go to your class discord for um, just the most bleeding edge information. Now, after that, unless you're like a cutting edge raider or something, then you'll probably want to get a couple of rank ones or rank twos, right? I mean, personally, I'll be working towards having legendaries that basically fit each gameplay niche that I am interested in, with, uh, you know, there then being a small initial focus on whatever serves me best in raiding. And then, by the way, if you want to quickly browse all of this stuff, um, just open up the adventure journal in uh, just in game and like mouse around it because it just lists all the powers and where they're from. 
And actually, that's it. That's basically all you need to know here. Um, sure, the finances really might sting here, but I'll tell you what, this system really does beat the hell out of the mad, mad randomness of Legion's Legendaries. Puts a lot more just control in your hands. You can work out what you want, and you can just go and work towards that. And I think that's really good for the health of the game. So, that is it for this video. That's it for me. Of course, be sure to hit that subscribe button, because there will be a lot of Shadowlands guide and just other content going on with this channel. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.